2012, Year of Prophecy. Many ancient civilizations experienced climate change and were destroyed by it. But in their texts and monuments, they left behind their prophecies that the next great climatic upheaval will occur in 2012. And today, our climate is changing. Is the prophecy becoming true? Surely there should be debate about the full meaning of these prophecies and the 2012 date, based as they are on the real experiences of real people. But our political and scientific establishments decided that our climate change is due to CO2 emissions alone. Views to the contrary have become denial or heresy. Of course the CO2 reductionists have hugely encouraged greener energy and other long overdue changes, but many scientists have challenged this CO2 consensus. Not CO2, they argue, but natural change that has happened before, but they are sidelined and their work ignored. But their views should be heard, that change is natural, that our planet is but a small speck in the vastness of an ever-changing universe. So please, watch, listen, and make up your own minds. If you talk to paleontologists, if you talk to astrophysicists, if you talk to people who have an understanding of natural cycles, um, you, have, you get a different picture. And they are complaining that then their view is not getting through. By the time the UN committees have resolved themselves into p political summaries, or shall we say summaries of the science for policy makers, what the policy should be, what the policy makers need to understand, the message gets steadily simplified and the dissenting voices are rooted out. So you have a consensus, which in science is rubbish. You, you don't work with consensus in science. You always have uh, a larger body who believe a particular picture and then you have a dissenting body who are continually working against that. That's, that is science and it's very important and all of the great breakthroughs have come from the dissenting body of knowledge and you have to fight to get that view through but you fight through objective presentation of information and facts. When you attach yourself and your reason for being is that certain things are happening. Instead of being open-minded and say, hey, yeah, we thought this was happening for this reason, but actually the evidence now shows that it isn't. So we're gonna actually change what we're saying here because we're intelligent people and we want to pursue what's right, not what we have attached to us as a dogma. What is actually happening, however, um, is that the Green Party is so attached to its global warming and it's terrible and must have been doing something about it, its greenhouse gases and its pollution, that they don't want to hear that that's not happening. Because their reason for being is being challenged. The very uh, reason that, uh, that they sell themselves and they get their backing and support, it's, they have to protect that. Everything's a vibrational construct, the human body, everything. The situations, organizations are vibrational constructs. And there's this phenomenon they call sympathetic resonance, whereby if you um, have, say, three violins and you uh, make the strings uh, play to a certain uh, note, a certain frequency, you introduce another violin and just put it there and leave it, that violin will start to pick up the frequency from the other three and start to vibrate into the same, right? I've seen this happen in politics and I've seen it happen so often. People go into politics, um, the political construct, which is the way it works, you call it a blueprint if you like, this is politics. They go in with the best of intentions and then gradually the construct vibrates them into line. Now, towards the end of the 90s, <clears throat> after the carbon dioxide picture had been sold to such a level, new data was coming through. Uh, senior researchers, particularly in astrophysics, were saying, hey, 
The sun is doing things that we haven't seen before. And we've discovered a link between the magnetic energy of the sun and the climate. That hadn't been suspected before. So that should then be taken on board and go, oh, new information? We should look at this. No, that's not what happens. Ooh, new information. Um, this is a problem. It, it, it sort of muddies the water. It, 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 we can't give a mixed message. Uh, the, the policymakers need, need clear guidance. And, and science does not want to say, actually, mm, we're not really sure about this. It means that our computers can't predict. And uh, you, actually, you, you don't need to give us all these billions because we, we can't answer your question. The science isn't going to say that. So the scientific establishment defends its position. The environmental groups who've been gathering campaign momentum around this, they don't, they're not ready to change. Uh, and the media, actually, um, so many science journalists have signed up and they've been at the forefront of the campaign. They find it very hard to change as well. So you have this kind of collusion going on, which is actually quite scary because it means that the real issue, there is a real problem on the horizon and it's, n it's not gaining any attention. It's certainly not gaining financial resources. And that is, the climate is unstable. It's, it's always actually been unstable, but we haven't noticed because we've been in a relatively stable period. And humanity has become more and more vulnerable to climate change, to the natural fluctuation. We're now six billion on the planet. Within the next 13 years, there'll be another billion mouths to feed. Uh, oil is, is just about to peak. All of the industrial civilization, everything you see around you is based on oil. Gas to certain degrees, well, mainly oil. And when that peak happens fully, it's happened in the States, it's happened in the North Sea, uh, the price, in my understanding, is going to go through the roof. And that will destabilize the world economy. Now, the, <clears throat> those who sit in higher positions of power and influence, they know all of this. I have absolutely no doubt that they know about this. It must be true this carbon caused global warming because the world's top scientists say so. No, that's what you're told, mate. In fact, there are enormous numbers of um, uh, scientists who question that and indeed put forward extremely compelling evidence to show that it's not caused by carbon dioxide at all. Mars and the other planets are also warming up. Are they driving a lot of uh, trucks on Mars? Well, I don't see. There are two rovers now on Mars. Well, okay, there is climate change. And this theory, in fact, uh, hurts a lot of scientists. There are a lot of scientists that don't completely disagree with climate change. They say, look, there are other things. It happened in the past, it will it happens now, it's normal, it's a normal cycle. Why is everybody so upset? A lot of the cycles, and people are talking about the sun entering a new place of the galaxy, a new part of the galaxy that we haven't been around in for hundreds of millions of years. There are lots of unknowns on an astrophysics level. None of these scientists know exactly what drives the cycles of the sun. And we think of the sun, up until recently, scientifically, the sun was a constant point of light, like a nuclear reactor, virtually constant. It was called the solar constant. And if you just focus on the light of the sun, it is pretty constant. Actually, even the light of the sun has an 11-year cycle. It varies by 0.01%. Now, that's not constant. Right? But on a magnetic level, and nobody looked at the magnetic cycles of the sun until recently. We didn't have the instruments. Now we've got the instruments. We see the sun is, in a, in a way, like a woman. It's got periods, it's got cycles. And some of these are very, very long term. We were talking earlier about science not being interested in this. Science is very patriarchal. I think, oddly enough, it just cannot handle periods and cycles, and it doesn't want to get into prediction. 
And science is only ever concerned with the external, objective, consensual reality. Now that's all very fine if you want to build something in engineering, but it's only half the story. The internal part, the soul, our dreaming. Nothing that we've created could be created without first dreaming it. Um, I have no doubt uh, that it's the sun. And it's like staggering, isn't it? You know, it's like staggering. I, 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 I sit back in amazement. Do you think that the sun getting stronger could, could affect the temperatures on Earth? Do you think that's possible? I've noticed, you know, when I go at the sun and the kind of sun comes out, it gets warmer. I noticed that. I think there could be some connection here. I mean, please. What's happening here is instead of looking at this dispassionately, instead of trying to sell a manufactured problem for grotesque ends, we should be saying, hold on a second. What are, what are the effects of global warming going to be? Because we need to start mitigating for those areas of the world that it's going to cause a problem for. And we need to start looking at how we're going to take great advantage of those of those things, the great things it's going to bring to other parts of the world. Instead of that, we're off on, on this carbon dioxide thing, and it's taking uh, complete attention away from, from other things that we could be doing. What we're seeing today in terms of global warming and climate change and all the rest of it that goes with that, I do not believe is being caused by mankind and the emissions from our cars and factories and so on. I don't say that those things are a good, good thing, far from it. Um, I think it's a disaster that we've used up so much of the Earth's resources so quickly. But those are not what are driving the change of climate on this Earth. It's the sun that's done it. Yeah? It's the sun, and, and the, the sun itself is being driven by cosmic forces as well. That we live within a, a universe of change, and it's foolish of us to think otherwise. When you look at the, uh, the graphs of um, what they call sunspot activity, when incredible explosions of, of energy are being released from the sun, some of them the size of the Earth, some even the size of Jupiter, um, and that this is a physical expression of increased solar activity, an increased solar radiation, which is brought through the solar system or what they call the solar wind. Um, when you see the graph of when you get more solar activity like that, and the graph of uh, Earth temperatures, and then when the, 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 the sunspot activity falls and the, the amount of solar radiation being emitted falls, so do the temperatures, right? I think, I think we might be onto something here. If there is one solar flare, two and a half times bigger than the one from 1989 that destroyed the electric grid system in Canada, then the whole worldwide grid system will be completely shut down for at least uh, several years. Solar flares associated with sunspots are the sudden eruption of particles and electromagnetic energy stored in the corona of the sun. Solar activity varies with an 11 year cycle and at its peak there are typically more sunspots and hence more solar flares. Sunspots are darker, cooler areas than the rest of the sun and it is when more of these sunspots appear that cause some researchers to theorize that a huge solar flare could hit the earth with dire consequences. Now think about it, if you don't have any electricity then everything stops. Our whole society will collapse in only two weeks you won't have food, you won't have drink, you won't have any money, nothing will work again. So uh, people will start killing each other only after two or three weeks. And, and uh, the, the, the societies that have no electricity, they can survive, but we can't survive. This is what can happen without, uh, with a high possibility. And, that is also the reason why they are now, uh, they are, have sent so many uh, probes to the sun to, to, to see what will happen in 2012 because they are expecting very big problems. They know about it, but they don't want to talk about it up to this moment. However, this planet of ours, the Earth, also has many variables, many factors that could cause or add to climate change. 
and could alter human behavior. Factors like the magnetic field, which protects us from harmful cosmic and solar rays, and the Earth's pulse, the Schumann resonance, this being the electromagnetic waves which exist between the ionosphere and the Earth's surface, which resonates at around 8 Hz per second, and some researchers tie these naturally formed electromagnetic waves to human brain waves, and believe that a change in this resonance could affect human behavior. <clears throat> I've spent the bulk of my adult life um, studying and researching ancient texts, traditions, cultures, the wisdom of those who have come before us. And they do, in fact, uh, the texts, some of the calendars going back over 18,000 years, that's before the last ice age, uh, all point to this time in history. And they say that we are living a very unique time. Um, in the words that they left for us, they describe the time as a time of great change. And we've all heard about the prophecies that all converge in this moment in history. And that doesn't mean a lot to someone in the West because we tend to discount those. Well, as a scientist, what I can tell you as a former Earth scientist is that we are seeing measurable parameters that, uh, that are changing and appear to be converging. Uh, for example, the magnetic fields of the Earth are in rapid decline right now. They reached the peak about 2,000 years ago. They have declined consistently, never looked back since then. We are now at the lowest magnetic point in uh, global magnetics that we've been the last 2,000 years. So in the geologic record, we can see this has happened at least 14 times in the last four and a half million years. It generally, uh, in the past, has been a precursor to what scientists call a reversal or a flip in the magnetic fields of the Earth. Not the Earth physically, <clears throat> rather the energetic sense, the, the field itself. Uh, and it's got to be a really uh, weird day, the day that this happens. People obviously have lived through it before. The Hopi have talked about it in their traditions. Uh, biblical <clears throat> traditions talk about this in, in Egyptian traditions. What we know is that the magnetic fields and our bodies are very closely related, that a change in the magnetic fields of the Earth uh, affect our, um, our dream states. And people are talking about having very, very intense, very vivid dreams, sleep patterns, uh, time and space. People feel that time is speeding up. So in addition to the magnetics dropping, there's a second parameter that the ancients called the heartbeat of the Earth. Uh, scientists first measured this directly in 1899. It's a, a fundamental pulse of about 7.8 uh, uh, cycles or hertz per second. So it's just uh, it's a, a constant pulse. And we believed that it was so constant it would never change. And we built communication systems, we built military weaponry based on this pulse all up through the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and the 80s and 90s that pulse began to increase. Our bodies, our cells, are tuned to this fundamental per, uh, pulse of, of our, our Mother Earth, as the ancients said. And that our metabolism, our bodies, our rhythms, our cycles will try to match the pulse of the Earth. So as that pulse increases, to us it seems as though time is speeding up because we're trying to, to uh, keep pace with that fundamental heartbeat. So we have these two parameters, this pulse that's increasing, the magnetics that are decreasing, and from the geologic record it appears that when those two parameters converge that that is a time the ancients called uh, the great shift of the ages or uh, uh, the, uh, the shift between the worlds. In studies of, of geomagnetic reversals in the laboratory they found that it would occur when uh, the geomagnetic field weakens and re re reduces and you would also get areas of, reduce, of uh, inverted field breaking out in sort of odd areas and both of those things have now come to pass because it's been found that the, the Earth's magnetic field is dropping quite a lot. It's been dropping for 2,000 years and there's a big area of reversed magnetic um, field off of South Africa. So that seems to fit into this idea that we have started on a geomagnetic reversal. It's a very interesting area of research about the way that the Earth's magnetic field is linked to times of change. Now we know that at the moment the Earth's magnetic field is about to switch. It's, it's actually weakening. What's happening is there are islands of opposite polarity appearing in different places. There's one in South Africa for instance. Um, so as the, the, the force field weakens, so the Earth becomes more open to outside forces and influences than it is when 
the, the, the shield, the, the force feels as its as strongest and shielding us from those influences. It's a bit like an umbrella, you know, you put your umbrella up and the rain can't reach you. you put it down and if it is raining then that rain is going to make you wet. So this seems to be something to do with this turning, this changing times that we're seeing. And whether this is going to take a few hundred years to make a full turnover or whether it's going to be a very sudden event, nobody actually knows. People make forecasts and they make suggestions and they, make, they have hunches, but nobody knows. But what we do know is that it is, is in the process of changing and has done so many times before. There are many theories about what causes a geomagnetic reversal or flip of the magnetic field and what effect it might have on the planet and us. But what concerns some researchers more is a geographical pole shift. This is a shift of the axis of rotation of the Earth or a slippage of its mantle. While well, much debate continues about both events happening anytime soon, Patrick Joel thinks he knows when and how both could occur. Nobody knows the theory that the Maya knew. No scientist today knows the theory about the sunspot cycle. It took me many years to find and to decode this theory. And why is this theory true? Well, I was the only one in the world uh, about 30 years ago. I was the only one that uh, postulated billions of quasars into the infrared that have a speed of the, the, of the light going from us. I was on the Belgian television 17 years ago and I explained that the universe is accelerating, the expansion is accelerating, because I have a complete new theory about uh, the universe. It's not that difficult, it's an easy theory. Everybody can understand it, only I have an hour to explain it to, 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 to everybody. And with this knowledge, because I so, know so much about astronomy, I was able to decode the Dresden Codex of the Maya and to find this theory that is not known. And because nobody knows about it, uh, nobody can calculate it. And this reversal of the rotation of the Earth can be found in the written, uh, in the Book of the Dead from the Egyptians. A Frenchman, Albert Schlossmann, translated that uh, 25 years ago and uh, no longer, even 30 years ago and he has written about 10 books about his story and nobody believed him but uh, in his translation we found several astronomical codes and we were able to decode these astronomical codes it had to do with a movement from Venus above Orion now Venus was very important with the Mayas and Orion, as we know now, was very important with the Egyptians. If you combine these two, then uh, you can find why they made uh, an astronomical code with Venus, the Sun and Orion. And the, the next code for Venus and Orion is for 2012. Flood myths occur in almost all cultures. And in these myths, and in ancient texts, Patrick found the clues to his search for answers regarding the pole reversal. There are hundreds of flood stories around the world. And uh, in many of the flood stories you can see that uh, the boats went very high. Only the highest tops of the mountains were visible. Now, how can you explain that? There is not, nobody knows about such a high flood. But if there is a polar reversal, according to the Egyptians, then the Earth starts rotating the other way around. So a 360 degree, degree difference. How is that possible? Now, actually, the Earth is turning this way. If you have a wave of particles from the Sun that fall into the magnetic field of the Earth, then they will create an opposite current. And at that moment, the inner core of the Earth, that is only 1200 kilometers, it will come upside down. When it turns this way, it will turn upside down. So the Earth, in fact, starts rotating the other way around. Now, if you know that at the equator, the speed is 1600 kilometers an hour, that will stop in one day. 
and then it will start rotating the other way around. That is a speed difference of 3000 km an hour. If you are driving with a car very fast and you stop, you are thrown forwards. The same with the oceans. The, earth the outer crust of the earth it will stop rotating and then rotating the other way around. But the oceans can't stop, they go the other way. They go just further and that will give a massive wave from two kilometers height. And that is why the story of Noah is true and why we have to... Uh, there are two, only two su survival possibilities in the high mountains or on an unsinkable boat. It is no secret that these events have happened in the past, and in fact, some researchers and archaeologists claim that the legendary city of Atlantis was lost to such a pole shift. The survivors fled to Egypt, where they passed on their knowledge, but with little evidence found about the mysterious city of Atlantis, these claims cannot be substantiated. Now there is a lot of more evidence, but most of the evidence can be found at a huge site in Egypt, and that is called the labyrinth. What can we expect to find in the labyrinth? Well, first, uh, how the earth looked like before the previous pole shift. After the previous pole shift, about 12,000 years ago, uh, Hudson Bay lay under the, south, under the then South Pole, what is now the North Pole. And uh, in one day, uh, America moved down 3,000 kilometers. So, uh, from under the ice, it came ice free. And Antarctica went under the ice. A large part uh, of uh, Antarctica was ice free, where the high civilization Atlantis existed, and in one day it was completely destroyed. I hope to find the maps from the Earth and from uh, Atlantis there. What can we find more? A hugely advanced uh, knowledge of mathematics and astronomy. Because the Egyptians uh, took uh, books from Atlantis to their country. And in the labyrinth they uh, made a large map, a zodiac of the sky. And in a special room that is called uh, the circle of gold, they made 36 hieroglyphs in which they calculated when the next polar reversal would take place. And they also say, like the Maya, 2012. And that is what we have to find. The mystery is exactly why would the ancients go to such lengths to hide this secret knowledge? Why not just put it on show for all to see? You have to understand knowledge is power. Do you know now something about uh, mass destruction, the, the atomic weapons? We don't know it, only the scientists know it. So, in the past it was the same. The high priest, they knew about it, but they have to keep it secret. If they knew when, uh, there was the, when the moon was becoming before the sun, then they had power. Uh, if everybody knows it, they, they lose their power. So, they were smart and they said, OK, we will encode it so that in a far future, people who are smart enough can translate this. And uh, of course, it took me many years to, to, to find their and to crack their encodings, but I succeeded. And if there are other people in the world who can uh, uh, sh uh, look at my encodings, they will find the same. They will say, OK, this is about this theory, this theory is not known, so there is going to happen something very huge.
As with most prophecies, the Mayan prophecy of 2012 is down to interpretation. The end of the world, or the end of time, have different meanings to different people. It is only when we scratch the surface and look deeper into the history of the Maya and other ancient civilizations that we can begin to truly understand their legacy. The ancient Maya left something behind in their texts, calendars and monuments that was certainly of great importance. So who were these people and what made them so special? One of the interesting things about the ancient Maya is their preciseness. Alone among the people of Central America, they developed language, uh, reading, writing skills, the, the kind of thing that we, we know from people like the ancient Egyptians, but they're the only people in Central America who actually developed an equivalent system to the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So for that reason alone, we know a lot more about them and what they believed in and what they knew. But over and above that, they also seem to have this extraordinary ability at mathematics. For instance, they had um, zero, the numbers that we take for, for granted that we, we have the zero. Um, the ancient Romans didn't. The ancient Romans used um, you know, Roman numerals. Can you imagine what it was like trying to, ma to, to multiply two Roman numerals together? It must have been an absolute nightmare. But it's not that difficult with the Mayan um, number system, just as it is with our own. So these people were very, very clever and they were very skilled mathematically and they were also extremely good astronomers. So that kind of sets them head and shoulders above virtually every other ancient civilization you can think of. When I started getting involved in researching the Maya, it really came out of a love for the Maya people. Uh, my travels in the 80s, living and working with the Maya, doing service work and so on. I really wanted to give something back to the Maya people and I felt that I was I, I had an ability to, to sort of recover you know the lost artifacts of the ancient wisdom the long count calendar is not a calendar system that is still followed among the Maya the 260 day calendar is and that's really the core building block the 260 day calendar is uh, made up of a combination of 30 numbers and 20 day signs the idea is each each day has its own particular energetic um, atmosphere, you know, it's got its own quality and the day you're born on gives you a certain um, characteristic uh, preponderance towards certain characteristics. Uh, and, and so each day has its own flavour and it, its own different quality which is good for some things and not so good for others. A little bit like uh, astrology, Western astrology in some ways. What are the benefits of using the Mayan calendar? Well. Not if you're trying to work out when you're going to send your Auntie Doris a Christmas card. Um, but if you're a Mayan, they kept their calendars not just to record uh, particular events and days and plan for the future, but because each day has a particular name, and each day name is either lucky or unlucky. So they had a kind of astrology going on as it were, with day names, rather like the Chinese horoscopes, you know, the year of the monkey and the year of the monkey with that. They had their different day names, and you would be named after your day that you were born on, and that would determine your place in life, extraordinary as it may seem, you know, because you were fixed by that, that day. So they still use part of the calendar, what's called a 260-day Sulkin cycle. They still use it now to work out which are auspicious days, which are inauspicious, when they should do certain things, when certain things can be expected. And they also use time and the cycles of time to make predictions. And actually, if you were talking to a Mayan elder now, they would tell you that they know that the, the year 2012, things are going to happen because it fits in with other cycles and what happened before on equivalent time. So they're looking like that as a kind of astrology. The Mayan calendar is actually a complex system of numerous calendars all working together to achieve different objectives. The core building block is the 260-day Tolkien cycle. It consists of 20 day signs, each with 13 variations. The 260-day period is key, because not only does it represent the period of human gestation, but also serves as a common denominator in the cycles of the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus and Mars. Along with this cycle, 
the Maya used the Harb calendar, which is the solar 365 day calendar, consisting of 18 months of 20 days, with a shorter 5 day month on the end. The days and months work in a fashion similar to the Gregorian calendar. When all the combinations of both calendars had occurred, this period was called a calendar round, precisely 52 years in length, and it was the shortest period of time in which the two calendars could synchronize. The Maya calculated longer periods of time using a five decimal long counting system. In this system, the Bacton was the longest period of time, going down to the shortest being a single day. The 2012 end date is calculated using this long count system, and the great cycle of 13 Bactons looks like this, giving the length of time from the 11th of August 3114 BC to the 21st of December 2012. The 13 Bacton cycle has been closely scrutinized and correlated with the Zolkin, Harb and our own Gregorian calendar to give us the 2012 end date. It is important to note that the full working of the calendars is much more complex and it has taken researchers decades to unfold only some of the information left on those monuments and in ancient texts. The Maya calendar can facilitate a better connection between us and nature because when we study the Maya calendar it, and we follow the Maya calendar, we can come into closer relationship with the cycles of nature. Uh, Mayan time philosophy is based upon observing the cycles in nature, everything from plant growth to the birth and life cycle of a human being to the greater cycles in the outer universe, the planets and, and the great cycle of procession, this great 26,000 year processional cycle. And the Zolkin, the 260 day calendar, is the key to all these different domains of human experience. So when we place ourselves into right rhythm, right relationship with this, with this calendar, then we just immediately come into better, more intimate union with nature and with other human beings. Now this, this business of the prophecy, the 2012 prophecy, a lot of people wonder where does this come from? Well, it's quite simple really, that in the sort of 18th, 19th century, people began to start um, decoding um, Maya hieroglyphs. And the first ones that they started decoding were numbers, because that's the easiest uh, point of departure. And they discovered that the Maya had a sort of calendar system of writing numbers with, res with respect to a start date. There were some equivalent dates after the time of the Spanish arrival, which were fixed in our calendar and fixed in theirs. And particularly the founding of a city called Merida in the Yucatan. And they were able to sort of, by doing that, correlate the two calendars together. And then they could say their start date was a date in 3114 BC. And their end date was going to be in the year 2012. 21st, 22nd of December. So that's how we know that the end of the present cycle is going to be in the year 2012. As we know, the Earth rotates on its axis at around 23.5 degrees orbiting the Sun. This gives us our seasons, because at different times in the year, different parts of the planet are closer to the Sun. There is, however, a phenomena called the precession of the equinox, where the Earth wobbles on its axis like a spinning top. One wobble taking 26,000 years to complete. The next completion takes place on the winter solstice 21st of December 2012, creating the alignment of the December solstice Sun as it travels along the ecliptic, that is, the path of the Sun as observed from Earth as it aligns with the dark rift in the Milky Way galaxy. This is what the Maya called the crossroads, or the sacred tree. Well, the sacred tree, or the world tree, the crossroads, it does have an astronomical location. It's the cross of the Milky Way and the ecliptic in the sky. And uh, 
There are two crossroads. There's one in Gemini and one in Sagittarius. The one in Sagittarius, I think, is, is really the, the most interesting one because it targets the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, on a spiritual level, the crossroads signifies the cross of our heart. You know, our heart is the place where the uh, struggles and darkness of the world meets the, the vertical axis. It's, it's kind of like where time meets eternity. And it's where the darkness meets the light. It's that magical place where the opposites get fused together. And I, I like, uh, there's a certain myth where, you know, the, the dark lords meet the emissaries of light. And it's their struggle back and forth that generates the nectar of consciousness. You know, it's really sort of, uh, um, it's the place where the realm of everyday consciousness meets the, the place where the underworld lords reside. You know, because that crossroads is the place in the sky where the road to the underworld is located. And this is the place in the sky that the December solstice sun lord, Wanhunapu, will be aligning with in 2012. So it's very beautiful how, how the astronomy reflects the prophecy and the spiritual teachings. Uh, the crossroads is the place where we can facilitate our own rebirth and renewal. I think that uh, the temporal location of this is in the years around 2012, but the place where it occurs is within our own hearts. While well, such places as Chichen Itza and Teotihuacan are world renowned for their astronomical alignments, it is a small archaeological site in the Chiapas named Izapa that we find images of the coming galactic alignment and more. This long count calendar that gives us the 2012 end date, uh, it, it seems to have been put in place about 2100 years ago by this early Maya culture called the Azapan civilization. At the site of Azapa, we have carved monuments and we have uh, orientations that, that, uh, that bring in this, this rare galactic alignment that culminates in 2012 the alignment of the December solstice sun with the dark rift in the Milky Way, right at the crossroads where the Milky Way crosses the, uh, the ecliptic. This rare alignment takes place only once every 26,000 years. And what I found in looking at the carved monuments of Izapa is that we have encoded here at the site the perennial wisdom associated with this astronomical alignment. It's not just about astronomy. There's a, a, a prophecy and there's spiritual teachings. And I think of Azapa as being sort of like a ground zero of the 2012 prophecy. And my work has been to give voice to these silent sentinels that are preserved at the site. And my intention and my hope is to be a conduit for clarity and a clarity of, of bringing back to consciousness this, this original teaching about 2012. I think it's very important to go right to the source of the revelation when it occurred because it seems to be that, that when a pure download happens and there's this beautiful thing put in place at the very beginning of the Mayan civilization, there is a tendency over time for the original revelation to get diluted or appropriated, you know, becomes codified into uh, religious hierarchies and systems and priesthoods and so on. But I think that it's really important that we plug right back into the original revelation at its source. The spiritual message that's preserved on the carved monuments of Izapa are basically the same message that we find in the hero twin creation myth. So basically the carved monuments are portraying that same teaching that we find in, in the Popol Vuh. And in that story, it's basically, in a nutshell, it's basically the relationship between Seven Macaw, who is the false ruler, and One Hunapu, who is the, uh, the consciousness that's been reborn uh, transformed by coming back into right relationship with the true cosmic source and center. So this dynamic between Seven Macaw and One Hunapu uh, and how the hero twins facilitate the demise of Seven Macaw and, and the rebirth of their father, One Hunapu, it's basically the perennial universal teaching 
about the relationship between the limited ego consciousness and the divine unlimited uh, true consciousness. And the spiritual message is that uh, we have an opportunity here at the end of the cycle to sacrifice or surrender the illusions that keep us uh, fixated to that limited state of consciousness that is ruled by the seven macaws of the world. Seven macaw being the, uh, the vain and false ego, you know, the, the, the ego out of control. And, uh, you know, ego has always been a fiction of convenience. Uh, but at some point uh, in the great cycles of time, hum humanity lost their connection with the true eternal consciousness, which is our birthright. It, it resides at the core of our hearts. And when that connection got severed, then ego sort of got deputized to take over that function. And then things kind of just went haywire from there. So the core teaching is about right relationship with the true eternal self, and how at the end of the age we can facilitate that reconnection in our own hearts. How does the flow of time, how does that relate to the human race? Well, we've been following time you know, for thousands of years. If you go to Stonehenge, Stonehenge, one aspect of it is it's a giant clock. Everyone knows about the midsummer sunrise at Stonehenge over the heel stone, but there are other alignments as well there. And in fact, other stone circles were used similarly for recording time and movements of the sun and moon. Well, the Mayans and people like this had similar um, structures that did this for them. One of the main things that they were concerned about was the days when the sun passes directly overhead, which would be the start of the new year for them. And the way they would mark that is by raising a great pillar or shaft of a tree and you would see from the shadows the moment when that pillar casts no shadow. Now we don't get that living here in, in Europe because the sun never does pass directly overhead but in the tropics this is something that's very noticeable and very important. So the, the real clock that people have always worked with is actually out there and it's the movement of the sun, the stars, and the planets, the moon. And our relationship with that, which is why our clock face has 12 hours on it. Twice 12 is 24. Yeah, it's all derived from the movements of the sun. I guess I, I believe that the Maya perceived time as a, a cyclic process. And it's not a linear thing like we have in Western time philosophy. Uh, time always moves in cycles, but there's a very deep understanding that the Maya had of cyclic time. It's not so much a circle which seems to have uh, no beginning and no end. Instead, time is, it's kind of like a cycle, but it's like the breathing cycle. It's like breathing in and breathing out. It's like moving into closer relationship with the source and then moving out of relationship with the source. And the Maya understood that this kind of understanding of cyclic time brings us into and out of relationship with our true selves. It's very much a part of the cycles of time that there's cycles, there's, there's periods of increasing darkness when humanity is forgetting their true natures. And then there's periods in which humanity is remembering their true natures. And the Mayan insight about this understanding of the cyclic nature of time is that 2012 signifies the turning point in which we are going to stop moving away from being related to our true selves, the in infinite, eternal heart of heaven. And instead, we're going to turn the corner and have this opportunity to move back into closer, more intimate union with the eternal creator and our true selves. The beauty of the Maya calendar especially for Western philosophy or Westerners, is that it provides a sacred dimension to experience. There's a certain quality or characteristic of life in the modern world in which we are disconnected from the sacred, sacred dimension. And it's the indigenous wisdom, uh, very nicely and beautifully exemplified in, in the Maya calendar, that 
can provide a doorway for us to reconnect with the sacred in our own lives. You have to understand that what we know about the Maya, we now know a lot more now than we did even 10, 20, 30 years ago. But there's probably still a lot more that we don't know. And in fact, the Mayan elders themselves tell us this. They tell us that there are things that they know that have been passed down to them by their ancestors, which they were not allowed to speak about, and which they're only now starting to reveal because we're coming up to this crucial date of 2012. So I personally think it's a fool who thinks we know everything. Yeah, a wise man is always open to discover that he doesn't know anything, that there's much more to learn. Unless we have a radical change of consciousness, that's the future that very large numbers of people seem to be okay with. And that, that's what I find scary, it's a future with no soul. And this is where I personally then leave the scientific and the political, which I, I, I'm still active in, and talk to my teachers, the yogis and the, and the, and the shamanic people. And they, they are saying, uh, Great Spirit will not allow this. It will not allow this deterioration of soul. There's a, there's a human project here, and she, the Great Mother, will bring it all down. She is going to wipe the slate clean, and uh, a big change, really deep change is coming. Uh, and uh, I don't know what that's about. We, we've, we've been given a time, a deadline, as it were, of 2012. And uh, you know, I have a Himalayan yogic master, and he's saying the same thing as the Mayans or the Hopi. Um, and they're saying that it will be sudden. And, uh, and after that, people will be awakened as if it will be such a huge change that it'll, it'll just change consciousness. Um, but at the same time, it is expected that a, a, a large part of the world's population will perish. So I think in terms of that 2012 point of reference, um, I think in, in, it's like the age of Aquarius, you think, well, where does it start, where do be, it, does it begin? And it's part of a kind of cycle that has a much, much broader parameters than that particular moment in time. But what it's generally speaking, we're already getting a flavour of where we're going, where we're headed, that we have, um, I, I think there is a global over, um, uh, more information than we can handle and, and, and infiltrate. So we have to, in a way, go back to, you know, what is going on on an inner level with, you know, we start with ourselves, we end with ourselves, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And we have to kind of filter through, simplify. We have to find what these essential truths are. And I think instinctively, a lot of us are already understanding that. So if we can kind of separate our kind of physical hunger and sort of look at it as getting spiritual fulfillment and you know we can say how we get there but I think that it's inevitable inevitable that we'll get to a point where we will kind of be in a position instead of having everything start rejecting and letting go and simplifying and that's going to perhaps be kind of a, a time of conflict because we're having messages all the time through our media that we have to eat more, consume more, buy more, have more, and yet we are inundated with stuff. So I, I think that we're going to have this shift where we're going to say, actually, do I need all this? And it's on a very simple level, but you think, well, you know, by having less, actually, you know, it's better for, for all of us if we kind of spread the resources a little bit and create more of a balance, and which has serious problems for our status quo and our ruling classes and that's going to be the big issue so there is going to be a little bit of conflict between what people really want on a, an intuitive level and, and uh, a level that feels right for them and their natural connection and care for other people who are in a position of not having enough and these kind of imbalances you know can be seen as a moral imbalance but it's a, a, a material imbalance and so 2012, I see that as kind of um, 
a kind of summit of that experience and you know what we're going to do about it we can do plenty about it but at the end of the day it has to be the will to do things and it's not political will it's the will of everybody so maybe a great leveling you know which is ties in nicely with the age of Aquarius because that's the age of Aquarius is about the global village about all of us being equal and all of us being concerned you know for my brother my sister that's a very Aquarian ideal so you know I'm looking and hoping that from where I'm standing astrologically that people will kind of connect up to this theme whatever it is it's you know 2012 is it the Olympics I mean what an outcry about that <laughs> you know, the logo that how chaotic how symbolic of, of this chaos that we're in um, and I think it's a focal point that whether you know as that name that word those collection of numbers sort of go around the planet however they got there people will know it's got some significance and they will create ah right you know we need to think about what this is all about and just be switched on to it so whether it's disaster you know or nirvana depends on you know where you are if it could be nirvana if you're you know some poor guy you know trying to scratch a living in the dust bowls of africa or it could be disaster if you happen to be one of the ruling classes who control everyone there is a vibrational change going on which is going to create a spiritual transformation on this planet um, and that one of the effects would be that our perception of time would change to the point where time would, I think one of the lines was, time would, would move so fast it will be frightening. Uh, because time's an illusion, it's, it's, it's the way that we um, observe events, you know, you can be in a dentist chair and time passes slow, you can your hand in a, 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 a saucepan of water, time passes uh, even slower, you can be in the um, company of someone you really want to be with, time passes very fast, I mean, it's just our, our relationship to events. And this vibrational change, I was told, is going to, in one way, change our relationship to events and uh, the way we observe events to the point where time seems to get here faster and faster and that this vibrational change was actually going to wake people up and they were going to see um, themselves and the world in, in ways that they, they didn't see themselves before. If you look at nature in the documentaries about uh, what happens in nature then nature is very hard. Uh, animals kill each other for food uh, so, uh, in fact, nature is violent. Only we, we people, are also very violent. Uh, I want to change our habit and I want to, to, to a new civilization based uh, on universal principles. That we don't destroy the earth anymore that we will uh, not kill other people anymore. This is, of course, this is... A lot of people will say, well, Hogwash, he is talking about new age. This is not new age. Uh, I'm talking about a renewed earth with uh, new principles. And we can restart everything from scratch. How long it will succeed, I don't know. But I hope thousands of years, because in the old writings from uh, the Egyptians, we found that a high civilization exists uh, for almost uh, 40,000 years. So that is a long time span. I don't really pay a lot of attention to uh, the, the various you know, differences in the scientific theories. Uh, I think that's all very interesting. Um, I think that no matter what might be happening in the external world, uh, the way that we can really facilitate change and transformation in the external world is to first do the spiritual work inside of ourselves. And, uh, you know, transformation in the physical world always is preceded by a transformation in the spiritual heart. So, to me it's a little bit, um, I guess I just don't choose to, to put a lot of focus on that, you know. It, it sort of gets into the ultimate questions of, like, 
you know, are we immortal beings? Do we have an immortal soul? Do we have a, an ability to connect into the eternal? You know, what is death? What lies beyond the, the gates of death? You know, these, these kind of contemplations and meditations, I think, is, is what the 2012 challenge uh, represents. And uh, so it, it kind of like invites us to have a deeper relationship with our true selves. One of the things that drives me forwards in my research is the belief, if you can put it that way, that there are things the ancients knew that we have forgotten and that there are things which they want us, or they wanted us to know, which they have encoded in their monuments and in their scriptures as a means of passing knowledge on to future generations. That's why I'm so interested in things like pyramids, because if you go out and build yourself a pyramid, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and you're doing it for a reason. One reason you're doing it is that you know it's going to last a long time. And one reason that you want it to last a long time is that you understand there's going to be times of change, catastrophe, maybe your whole civilization is going to disappear. And you want to pass on your core knowledge to the people of the future. The Egyptians did that, the Mayans did that. We ought to be doing the same thing, actually. This planet has a certain destiny, and the human race has a destiny. We can only do this once. If we, if we flunk this, if we don't make the leap to the next level of civilization, there won't be another chance on this planet. We will begin to see how our sun, and indeed its family of planets, are part of a greater whole, which is um, the Milky Way, and how that is part of a greater whole, which is the universe in general. And this is all going to be part of this new age consciousness, seeing our place in the greater society of things and stopping seeing us as just being this haphazard chance event. Chance event that you have gathering of gas that makes an atomic explosion of the sun. Chance event that some of this matter conglomerates and forms on Earth. Chance event that life actually grows on this Earth and evolves to become mankind. You know, all these chance events, you begin to understand that there is consciousness behind this and that this is uh, something which is being driven by higher powers than us. Whatever the year 2012 brings, the message embedded within it is predominantly one of them, that we will once more tread lightly upon this precious earth, become better people by understanding the legacy our ancestors have left us. We must learn to question all that we are told to think, to feel, to believe. Learn to question our history and along the way, be ready for some surprises.